welcome everyone to the panel about uh, rates, VAT, and community interest companies. It is way more interesting than it sounds, I promise you. Um, so my name's Sarah Thurtle. I'll be chairing the panel. Um, I work for a company called Creative United, and we do lots of work with lots of creative companies, music companies, venues on um, how they can best run their businesses so they can keep doing what they love doing. Um, today's panel is basically going to take, thank you, it's going to take the, uh, it's going to be taking a look at how best to approach company structures that can best reflect the cultural value of grassroots music venues. So there was a lot of talk this morning about um, identifying and how best to articulate the cultural value of music venues so they can be better understood, not just within the community of music fans and bands and artists, but beyond that for the towns and cities that they are working in. And also looking at the ways to adopt the best appropriate structures to reflect the kind of community value of a music venue, their not-for-profit activities in, the, in what they do and how company structures can best reflect that. Um, so on the panel here today, we have representatives that work across areas of business rates, community interest companies, VATs, who are running venues and doing programming within their communities. Um, You've got all the details about us in your booklets there, so the, uh, if you want to find out any more, look in your booklets. Each of uh, our panel will introduce themselves uh, briefly. So uh, we're going to have three 10-minute uh, talks or presentations um, from Alistair, Jeremy and Nick. We've got Alison from uh, the forum in Darlington on the panel as well. So she'll be joining in on the conversation after the presentations um, with the various talking points and questions that will come up. Towards the end, there'll be plenty of time to ask questions. Um, and I'll also be asking the panel to explain everything as we go along. I want to make sure that everything we're talking about is going to be relevant to you guys running music venues in your towns and cities. Um, so first of all, I'll ask uh, Alison just to briefly introduce herself, and then we'll be going through the presentations from Alistair, Jeremy, and Nick. Hi everyone, my name is Alice McKay, and um, I run the Forum Music Centre in Darlington in the northeast of England. The Forum was a, a privately owned company opened in 2004 in around 2008 hit massive difficulties and was on the decline for closure. In that small time it had been open, it became a major asset within the community and was loved dearly by very many people. I got together with the owner and we started way back then when community interest companies were very, I'd never even heard of them first on the scene, started to work on a business plan to um, turn this, what we saw as a community asset, really into the hands of the community. And the, the structure we saw work, would work for that would be community interest company. So we've been trading now, running the Forum Music Centre since January 2011. And um, we've come across many challenges, VAT being one of them, uh, business rates, all of these things that as a, as a business, um, you, you, we all need to start looking at these things and how, how we can work with VAT, how we can work with bus the businesses, local councils, to help keep these assets going. Um, so I'm very pleased to say we are still here and we're going quite strong. We're paying the bills anyway, at least. Thank you. So I think first up we've got uh, Alistair uh, with his 10 minute presentation. Hi, uh, I'm just going to give a, a brief chat about uh, the VAT and the VAT reliefs that are available to you as a, as a music venue because of the activities that you're undertaking. Now, VAT is not the most exciting subject, and uh, I'm sure that I will try and put it into your language, but <coughs> having done it, uh, if you have questions about what it means in real life, Alison will also be able to, to assist in you know, explain how she went through the process uh, in securing the, the reliefs. But as things currently stand, we are still part of the EU. A 
couple of years' time may not be, but uh, that's a different matter. But within EU legislation, there is a, a relief called cultural exemption, which has been brought into the UK uh, legislation. And what it allows for is for certain eligible bodies, and I'll talk about what an eligible body is in a second, uh, to exempt the right of admission to a museum, a theatrical performance, musical or choreograph uh, choreographical event. HMRC accept that a live music event qualifies as being a cultural event. So what this basically says is that rather than having to charge VAT on your ticket prices, uh, you can retain the full amount of the, of the ticket. Can you, Those, just, can you just say where, that, where we can find that? That what you've just said, that HMRC uh, it's a, saying that live music events qualify. Can you just reference it? it it's in their, their public notice, which I think is 701.47. So, it's just so I can go and look at it, thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Again, it's, it's accepted uh, that there's currently a, a case going through the, the, the European Court at the moment which is looking to extend the live into uh, recorded. So, for example, uh, it's the British Film Institute are taking a case which is going to the, the European uh, Commission. Uh, that is looking to extend the exemption. So there, there, there is no question at the moment that live events are, are always going to be uh, accepted by HMRC. Recorded events is, is a different matter at the, at the moment. The bodies that are eligible are local authorities and certain uh, bodies which meet the conditions set out in the legislation. And I'll come on to that in a second. The important point is that if your body does meet the conditions for the exemption, it is compulsory. It is not a nice to have, it's not a uh, planning arrangement, it is a relief that you must apply if you meet certain conditions. The conditions, sorry, do we have the, the slides? Uh, right, well, worry about that later. <laughs> right, the conditions, uh, be easier to, to, to talk about if they're on the screen, but uh, if you're a non-profit making body, and a non-profit making body doesn't mean to say that you go out to make a loss. It's actually a non-profit distributing body. And what it means is that if you make a profit from the, uh, the, the, the live performances, etc., you then use those uh, profits in the support of the venue, in the support of putting further performances on. You don't take it away uh, and, and you know and distribute it to uh, you know shareholders or, or whatever. So it's it, it talks about non-profit making, but it's really non-profit distributing, and that's all set out in the uh, the, the the articles of the uh, of the the entity when it's when it's set up. So <coughs> non-profit making applies any profit it makes from the exempt activities to the furtherance of those uh, activities and the improvements of the the facilities. And the final one is the one that trips up most uh, bodies is it's managed and administered uh, on an essentially voluntary basis with the people who are managing it don't have any direct or indirect financial gain from that management. That means that those people that are, have the strategic management can't take any money out of it. It doesn't mean to say that the day-to-day -day person who implements those strategic management uh, can't be paid a, a, a salary or a, a, an emolument. It just means that uh, the, 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 the ultimate owner who has the strategic direction of the, the business can't make any money out of it. They can't strip the, the profits out. It must be, as I say, profits must go back into improving the facility. So what does it mean in, in real terms? Well, there's, there's, there's pluses and there's gains. Uh, in, in, in VAT, very simply, uh, you've got your output tax, which is your, your, your VAT on your, your, your income, and you've got your input tax, which is your VAT on your expenditure. If it becomes exempt under this relief, it means that uh, for every ticket, you can retain an extra one-sixth. So if you're selling a ticket for £12, rather than paying £2 over to HMRC, you get to keep that full. £12 pounds rather than the 10 you would have been previously. Very simple on the sales side. On the purchases side, it means that 
uh, you can't recover the VAT in relation to operating that facility. Uh, if you're only talking about running costs, the running costs are likely to be significantly less than the income that you're taking in. Most of the, the, the cost that you're going to be having is going to be on uh, staff, uh, where there's no VAT, etc. Where it can be a problem is if you refurbish a, a, an event, uh, uh, sorry, a facility. Uh, you have to look at capital expenditure for the last 10 years uh, and you could have a clawback of the VAT that you, you previously recovered if you do implement this relief or if you are required to implement this relief. Uh, if you are not looking to, to do any refurbishment, the chances are the relief is going to be favourable to you. So what should you look to do going forward in relation to this? The first thing you, you, you should determine is what is your own status? Are you already required to comply with this? If you're already required to, to comply with this, there's a risk that HMRC could come uh, and, and, and challenge you for the, the VAT that you've recovered previously. If you don't already qualify, can you tweak your, uh, your, your status slightly in order that you do uh, are able to qualify? Or if you are looking to make a, a, a major capital uh, refurbishment, and if you th think of some of the, the venues that, you, that are in the, the brochure, uh, some of them are, 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 are you know, quite historic venues, and the refurbishment costs of something like that is likely to be quite considerable. Uh, <coughs> you may want to say, well, let's make sure we don't fall under this. Let's make sure that going forward we're able to uh, recover the VAT on that refurbishment. So let's very simply make sure that someone has a financial interest in the, uh, in the, uh, the, uh, the facility such that we fail to meet the test for the, for the exemption. Like I say, very dry subject, but it does mean that by implying it, you can uh, boost the, the income that's coming in from the same number of people coming through the door. Thank you. Yeah, um, I'm not sure how the slides thing is set up yeah. over here, but are, the, are those slides something that you'd be able to share via the Music Venues Trust yeah, yeah. if people wanted to take a look at those? That's great. Okay, thank you, Alistair. Um, the next presentation talk will be from Jeremy. Good afternoon. My name's Jeremy Mills, and I'm a trustee of the Music Venue Trust, and also run my own legal and tax consultancy, where I give advice on a, uh, to people on structuring their affairs to mitigate tax and protect their assets. Now, as part of that, I regularly get involved in, in uh, setting up businesses uh, and structuring them, or restructuring them, and often, I get involved also on the philanthropic side, setting up not-for-profit organisations, relating them with the, with the corporate organisations and making sure everything works in the round as well as possible. Obviously, I'm bound to say this, aren't I? But it makes a lot of sense, if you can, to take advice early if you're thinking up setting up a, a new venue or changing an existing one. Unfortunately, I do spend a lot of my time fixing th things that people have set up because they didn't have the advice to start with, wasn't set up as well as it might have been. And alas, it's normally more expensive to fix things and often less efficient than it would have been had advice been taken in the first place. Now, I appreciate that can be a very easy thing to say because often when you're particularly in setup mode, you don't have the money. But unfortunately, it's at that time when the advice is probably the most valuable. So I would say that uh, if, if, if you are in that position, it's worth trying to find some funds for some level of advice at that stage, rather than winging it, as often a lot of people will, obviously, to try and get, uh, get things done. So I guess the, the fundamental starting point for me, if I'm speaking to someone, is, is well, what are you looking at here? Is it for profit or not for profit? Because obviously that's a fundamental distinction. So if we, if we look at not-for-profit first, essentially, for me, we're looking at some sort of charitable enterprise. And there are four types of charitable structure. There's the unincorporated, unincorporated association, which is more like a, a club, a, a sort of sports club or a social club or something like that. There's a trust, which is a trust steeped in English law. 
and they run by a small number of people and generally aren't appropriate if you're transacting with others in any way. So often charitable organisations would have trust are purely grant giving. There's the company. Obviously companies have a huge advantage if you are transacting with others, you're taking out licences, you're employing people because you get the corporate level of protection. And there's this relatively new one called the Charitable Incorporated Organisation, which is a sort of hybrid between trust and company, uh, provides some, uh, many of the protections of companies without a lot of the compliance. And indeed, the CIO route was the route I used when setting up the Music Venue Trust. So clearly, if you go down the charity route, there are lots of benefits tax being the main one, like largely there isn't any, although VAT can get pretty complicated on, uh, on, on charities. And if you go down the CIO or company route, there's the issue of protection um, that you've got by having a sort of separate entity in between you and those with whom you're transacting. Burdens, well, uh, there's charity commission compliance, whatever route you go down. If you go down the corporate route, well, you've got Companies Act compliance as well, which is an addition. But the biggest one for most people is the lack of ability to take remuneration. And clearly those people that set up charities often do so with great charitable intent, but in the hope that they're going to get something out of it. And I have had, on a number of occasions, had to ask founders to step down and become employed directors and come off the board, because essentially you cannot be paid if you're operating a charity as a, as a, tr as a trustee, as a charity trustee. So that's the, for many people, the big drawback in charities, although for, for a, lot of, a lot of music type work, it is charitable in nature, essentially, and could easily come within the, the charitable definitions. So if we get in the profit off option, obviously there's a, there's a small number of structures there. You could be a sole trader, uh, you could be in partnership with others, obviously then there's the company, uh, and there's also another sort of hybrid, which is the limited liability partnership, which has many of the advantages of a company, but also it looks a bit like a partnership as well. Um, the, the benefits are, well, with sole trader is control and flexibility. Um, profit extraction's easy. Uh, for LLP or company, you've got protection of that, that entity. Uh, the burdens are sole trader, partnership, tax, you can't avoid the tax, it's assessed on you immediately. There's no way of, easy way of managing it. Uh, if you go down the sole trade or partnership route, you've got absolute liability personally, which is pretty horrific for most people. Um, and if you go down the LLP or company route, then obviously you've got the ongoing compliance. But the main reason I'm here today is to talk about community interest companies, which is in many ways the halfway house between uh, charities and um, fully profit organisations. So community interest companies were actually introduced in 2005, which always amazes me because they seem still to be something of the, the best kept secret. Uh, and they're really aimed at <coughs> social enterprises wishing to work for community benefit. Now they are formed under the Companies Act, so they are companies subject to Companies Act compliance, and the directors are subject to normal fiduciary director's duties under the Companies Act. So there's nothing special about them in that respect. A community interest company has to pass the community interest test in order to qualify as a community interest company. Um, and it has to be therefore pursuing a purpose beneficial to, to the community, um, which will um, benefit uh, the community or certainly a, a, a significant part of the community. That test is satisfied if the purpose for the organisation is not an excluded purpose, which is essentially a political party or political campaigning, and a reasonable person might consider that the activities are for the benefit of the community or a significant part of it. So it's a fairly wide objective test and I think many activities uh, particularly those that you're undertaking, should fall within that definition. So how do you set up a community interest company? Well, it, it's the normal route for setting up a company. However, in addition to the normal paperwork, uh, a community interest statement has to be prepared, which is your justification for qualifying as a community interest company. And all that paperwork gets sent to the Registrar of Companies, 
who then quickly forwards it on to the community interest company regulator. So there is a separate regulator for this type of organisation. That regulator will check that the rules are, are complied with, that, that it does benefit, then send it back to Companies House, um, who will then register it. Unfortunately, there's no sort of time limit timetable for this, so you are in the hands of the, the people working at the desk as how long it might take. Um, there are a few special requirements about them, which I will now move on to. The first one is that with regard to the name, the name must include the letter CIC or Community Interest Company. Um, and the articles can be normal companies' articles, but they have to contain specific provisions which enable them to qualify. And I'll come on to those in a minute when I quickly outline some of the potential burdens of operating under that sort of structure. The benefits, I think the one I really need to enforce is that it sounds like a charity, it sort of looks like a charity, but it's not. It is a commercial entity. You are allowed to make a profit and you are allowed to pay people. And this gives it a huge advantage over some sort of charitable structure. Um, it's in addition, because it's not a charity, it's not subject to Charity Commission compliance, although it is subject to Normal Companies Act. At compliance. The downsides to something like a community interest company is that, well, because it's not a charity, you don't get the charity tax reliefs. There are no tax advantages for going down the community interest company route. It is taxed as any other corporate organisation in that regard. So you do need to split your mind. A lot of people tend to think that it has the best of both worlds. It doesn't. It's more of a normal corporate entity than it is of a charity in that respect. The um, biggest question uh, or, or issue, restriction, about community interest companies is that ha the articles have to contain <coughs> an asset locking provision. Now, this means that the assets of the CIC cannot be paid out to the members. They can uh, only be retained for community purposes for which it was set up. They can be transferred for full consideration, in other words, if they're bought at market value. They can be transferred to another asset-locked company, or they can be transferred out for the benefit of the community. But the point is, once the assets are in there, they're largely in there, and the shareholders cannot get them back. All the shareholders could get back if the company was wound up, would be the paid up value of their shares. There is no bunts or bonus, no windfall uh, available. And that's probably the biggest distinction between that and a normal company. There is no windfall. However, because of the asset locking provisions um, and, the, and the dedicated use of these to serve the community, I am finding that more and more grants are opening up for the CIC structure because people have some confidence of knowing they're dealing with a company, but it's a company with a specified purpose, with locking in the articles as to what it can and can't do with its assets. Uh, tied with the asset locking, uh, there is a restriction on how money can come out of the company. Now, the, when these were set up, the government wanted people to be paid properly. So it, it's not... We're not in the charitable sector here. They want good people running CICs and accept that they should be paid commercial rates for them. So directors can and should be paid properly. There is a restriction on dividends because dividends are profits of the organisation which has been set up to benefit the community. And essentially, the current regulations provide that no more than 35% of the distrib distributable profits in any one year can be paid out in dividends. But the fact of the matter is, dividends can be paid out. And there are a number of other restrictions to ensure that bonuses or loan arrangements can't be used to circumvent the overriding objective to retain the money within that structure for the benefit of the community. Um, I have been involved over the last few months advising a couple of new venues about the desirability of community interest companies. And I think there's a lot to be said for going down that route because of this sort of hybrid ability to qualify for grants, um, be perceived as something for the community, because you are, 
but at the same time ensure that people can be remuner remunerated properly, properly from them. Um, and yeah, that's that's it really. It's a quick, quick whirlwind tour of, of community interest companies. Oh, the other thing I was going to say is that if you do have an existing charity or an existing entity, you can transfer into a community interest company. But clearly, various changes will be made, need to be made to the existing organisation that you have uh, in order to make sure that it does qualify under the community <coughs> interest company regulations. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you, Jeremy. Uh, there's lots to take in there. So if anything, you're, you're pondering about any of those um, phrases and words to describe how a community interest company works, um, we'll be taking questions after um, this presentation and we'll be discussing it some more, what these actually mean for music venues. Um, examples and how it, how it works in practice. So we're going to see now if there's some um, magic with another laptop. Okay, just filling in time. I don't know any jokes. Okay, that's good. No jokes. Okay. Um, so next we have uh, Nick talking about we managed to get some slides. business rates. I'm going, to, I'm going to stand up as well. I've been sitting down all day and I'm not going to use a microphone. So if you can't hear me, just wave and I'll, I'll give up. Um, I'm Nick Wright, um, I'm business rate specialist for the last uh, 25 years, which is both equally impressive and personally depressing. Um, uh, I know that business rates isn't the sexiest of subjects, but we've been talking about that, so that makes me feel a bit like a sort of crazy party animal. Um, but I'll try not to, um, I'll try not to engender that, that uh, reaction. Um, business rates has been around for 400 years. I'm going to try and tell you how it works in less than one minute. So uh, here goes. Um, first of all, it's uh, every property, every business property pays business rates. It's a rental valuation of the property, which is why charter surveyors like me get involved. Um, and um, they put what's called a rateable value on your property. And anyone that pays business rates would have seen it on their rates bill, the rateable value. And that's what you've got to keep at uh, the forefront of your mind. Um, all venues across um, England, Wales, and Scotland have been revalued just now. So um, at the moment, you have two rateable values. You have your what's called your current one, but it's about to come to an end uh, in April next year. But you also have a draft figure, which is your new valuation. And those values will probably be different. And it's all based on the valuation date used by uh, set down legislation. Um, common misconception, the council don't set your rates. So as much as you want to moan about the council, the fact they don't empty your bins and all that stuff, they have nothing to do with it. It's actually set by the Valuation Office Agency, who are part of HMRC. They value the property, and then the council just send out the bills and collect, uh, collect the rates. What the council do do, though, is they're in charge of giving rates relief, which is a, a key point they're going to come on to. Uh, the one constant between those two organisations is neither like giving away any money, um, and that's increasingly um, a theme, uh, and again, we'll touch on that as well. Um, and then finally, oh, oh, yeah, finally, business rates is a massive, massive burden. And um, over the years, I've seen it kill companies. Um, it's, uh, it, it's, it's a horrendous tax. It's basically a tax rate of 50%, which in, in my mind is when you get to that sort of level of tax, it, you know, you, you kind of lost the plot. So you've got to get your head around business rates if you've got a venue, and you need, um, you need a strategy for dealing with it. So uh, what I want to do, though, is not talk too, too sort of theoretically. I wanted to give you some actual examples, just so we know what we're dealing about. Um, we haven't got time for a quiz, but anyway, the name's on it, so that's no good. Um, this is the Robin in um, Birm uh, Birmingham area. That is, and I talked about the revaluation. Uh, that is seeing an 8% decrease in its rate or value. We've got uh, the Brook Southampton, one of my favourite venues. That is seeing a 27% increase in its value. The uh, O2 in Islington, that's seeing a 50% decrease in its rateable value. We've got the 100 Club in Oxford Street, that's seeing a 50% increase. Uh, just around the corner, the Dublin Castle. An 8% decrease in its rateable value. The Wedgwood Rooms down in South Sea, 25% increase. The Roundhouse, where we are, a 3% increase. Now, hopefully, you're all confused. 
and so um, you probably think, well, what the hell's going on? What, how, what, what is all this stuff? It's going up, it's going down. Uh, what's happening? And this is a problem for, for um, venue owners. Well, if you weren't confused then, I'm going to confuse you now. Um, this is a very, very important venue because this is the forum in Tunbridge Wells, which uh, uh, Mark, uh, <laughs> Mark runs. Um, and uh, this, this, this is very confusing. So, Forum in Tunbridge well is Wells is facing a 33% increase in its rateable value. Not good news, right? Its rates bill next year is looking at a 100% decrease. And this is how confusing the whole issue of, of rates are. So, if you were confused previously, you're probably confused now. And um, I want to sort of come on to why, why is this whole area just so, so bewildering? Um, it's, it's not really like um, VAT in the sense that VAT, there are very clear rules set down. And you, yes, you've got to navigate them uh, and understand the implication of them. But, but rates, it's just, it's just a crazy, crazy thing. And um, there's really two reasons why it's all so confusing. And the first is that the valuation office agency who set the values, they can't really make their mind up with venues, with music venues, whether they're valuing them as a pub, uh, as a venue, as a concert hall, as a bar, cafe, or as a nightclub. And the issue there is that all of those different classes of property have a different way of valuing them. So some will be valued based on rental levels, some will be valued based on um, accounts, uh, receipts and expenditure, and some will be valued on building costs. And they, can't, they just can't get their head around it because they've got pretty small heads, to be honest. Um, so that's the, first, that's the first reason. And then the second reason is that there's a very complicated web of rates relief. And the rates relief is related, in some cases, to the level of rateable value. So what you get is this sort of impenetrable system around business rates. But there are some things you can do, and I wanted this to be a sort of really practical, practical talk for you about what you can um, do to try and help. So the first thing you've got to do is you've got to check whether you are due any rates relief at all. And um, you, don't, you don't need the likes of me, sadly, to do that for you and charge your fee. You can do this yourself, and you ring up the council, and there's basically two reliefs that are probably going to be um, worth checking on. So the first is small business rates relief. Now this is a very generous relief. It's, it's, it's unbelievably generous and it pains me to say that. But if you've got a rateable value of up to um, 15,000 pounds next year, because it's, it, they, the uh, thresholds have been increased, but up to 15,000 pounds next year, you can get small business rates relief. And it's so generous, with up to £12,000, uh, if it's your only property, you're not going to pay any rates. So that, 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 is, that, is, a, that is a massive um, um, saving. And that's why, in the case of the forum in Tunbridge Wells, that's why that rateable value went up by 33%. So it went from 9000 to 12000 But in fact, next year, it won't be paying any rates at all. So that's a really important relief to check. And then the second one is, are you due any discretionary rate relief? And that's a relief for being non-profit or, um, uh, or, or a, C, a CIC. Um, and we'll come on to discretion relief. Um, hopefully, um, you'll appreciate that I'm not going to turn up this afternoon without a shameless plug. So um, here it comes, I'm warning you. Um, the second thing you've got to do is you need to um, think about whether you need to appeal your rateable value. So every, uh, every rate payer in the country has a right of appeal against the rateable value. Um, and it's unbelievable how wrong these rateable values are. You can get some really big reductions. And not only will the reduction in your rateable value lead to savings, um, both historic savings in the form of a refund and also reduced bills in the future, but also it can knock you below the threshold for relief. And that, that is absolutely critical. So I saw a gentleman who's not uh, here in the audience, which is uh, particularly distressing. Um, but I saw him earlier, because he had a problem with his rates, and um, his rateable value has been valued at £15,000 for next year. It's completely wrong. I know it's wrong. Um, and it should be £10,000. 
But at the moment, he's faced with a bill of £7,000. If he can appeal that and get it down, he won't pay any rates. It's £7,000 straight to the bottom line. So you, you've got to get all over and carry out an appeal. Um, and you need to act now, because there's various deadlines, I won't bore you with them, but the first one comes up at the end of November. You, you need to get onto this and, um, and work out whether there are some savings opportunities for you. Um, it, <laughs> this is the shameless plug. <laughs> uh, it, it is it's complicated. It's really complicated. And the reason why it's complicated is um, what you need to do is use the inconsistency of the valuation office agency's approach to these venues. You need to use that to your advantage. So there may be um, instances where your rateable value could be reduced, maybe by changing whether you're valued um, as a nightclub, maybe you should be valued as a pub, or vice versa. And I, I see a lot of opportunity for venue owners um, around a business rates appeal system. Um, and having had a good look at some of these new values, because of coming <coughs> here, you know, there's some big old increases. And um, I think there's some really good savings to be had, but you, you need to get on with it. Um, this is a really um, key question. So if you are um, a community interest company, can you get discretionary rates relief? And um, a lot of people think, well, not for profit, yeah, I'm going to get discretionary rates relief. It is unlikely. And I know that's kind of not, <laughs> maybe not the message people want to hear, but that's, that's the reality. And because um, Alison, you, you don't get discretionary rates relief, do you? No, we just get small business. You just get small business. And, and the reason for that is, is that small business rates relief is a man mandatory relief. And what that means is the council don't basically pay for it, the government does. The discretionary rates relief comes out of the council taxpayers' pocket. And so the councils have a policy of, um, well, look, put in an application, and if you can show that um, it really benefits the community, what you're doing, we might give it to you. But I can tell you, nine times out of ten, they will not give it. And in fact, um, councils in general, as far as I can make out, are really rolling back on giving, uh, on giving rates relief. As this whole sort of localism thing carries on and, and they get responsibility for their own rates, they just don't want to grant um, rates relief. So don't think that if you convert or you set up as a CIC, don't think that you will automatically get uh, discretionary rates relief. Even if you read on the council's website that they have the power to grant it, my experience says they probably won't. But you should go through trying to get it. That makes sense. Um, just in terms of what does the future hold uh, for rates, well, it holds a lot of pain because you're still going to have to keep paying these massive, massive rates bills. But you're right now, you've got this big opportunity for trying to get some savings, both going back for a couple of years and also going forward for five years. And I would really urge you to, uh, to, to look at that. Um, doing nothing is not an option. Um, there are a whole load of deadlines involved with the rates if you want to challenge them. And you, um, if you miss them, you've missed the boat. So um, I'm very happy to talk to anyone, anyone after if, you, if you'd like to or just get in touch with me. But there's a, I really see a big opportunity for venue, um, venue operators in, uh, in saving money on business rates. <coughs> Thank you very much, Nick. Thank you for the comedy pictures. Um, so we've had three really in-depth, uh, lots of detail in their perspectives on different areas of um, running a business, rates, VAT, company structures. There's a lot to digest there, there's a lot of detail. Um, so what I want to do now, Alison, <laughs> is, is come to you because you've, you've looked at all of these questions. Yeah, we have. You've, you've probably done a lot of reading around these subjects and you've digested it and you've sifted through and found out what worked for you. What, what were the first things to tackle and get your head around that made sense for a music venue? Um, well, first things first, when we took over the forum to save it from closure, um, that was our main focus, saving it and, and sustaining it and keeping it going. And um, bit by bit, we started looking at different areas. The VAT was something that really did 
bugged me a lot because it was it was a massive amount to pay. We were in an environment in a small town where you, you've got the public saying, I'm not paying any more than £5 for a ticket and the band's costs increasing and by the time you gave 20% of that away you know it was a it was a big problem um, so bit by bit that was something that I kept asking questions along the way I'm not from a, uh, a financial background accounts you know I think I failed or just scraped through mathematics you know frighten the life out of me um, but bit by bit I came to that point of then looking at the VAT and thinking there must be something in this it, you know how do other venues do it how do you survive um, and it was then that I, I sat trolling through the HMRC, the VAT website, and came across um, this 70147, yeah. And um, just by first reading it, thought there's something in this. Got someone who, who is a, a bit more of a, uh, has a, has a bit more knowledge to look at it. So what we found within our business, we have, uh, and this is just the natural way we progressed because we took over a, a company, a music venue that was closing, we already had a, a group of, of community people, of volunteers, um, of general public who just had a massive will of not wanting this venue to close down, like many venues we've, we've heard here. And um, they, to me, were my... Uh, kind of person on my shoulder as I was working through trying to stabilize the business these were the people that I consulted with because these the the people that you know felt really passionate about it and and kept them on board and kept them around me so when it comes to putting on gigs and what we should schedule and um, needing a bit of hand these are the people I would go to and ask them the questions so it became a natural um <coughs> Uh, kind of movement in a way to formalise this group um, for them and to structure it and, and for us. And um, looking at the VAT notice, what, what I could translate from it was just like you said there, that as long as there wasn't any individual or the organisation as a whole profiting, um, basically taking the, whatever the profit was in the ticket sales and going, hey, let's go for a staff night out or let's, you know, um, do something completely unrelated to the gigs and the entertainment side, then these, this could be exempt. So the way we, we did it, and I hope it's right, <laughs> you never quite know, um, was we, we set a, a different accountancy section. So basically we have everything to do with our um, the gigs, any sales, any revenue generated from events is accounted for completely separate. Any authority on those events are, are by the, uh, what we call our cultural committee. So they, they schedule the events, they schedule the gigs. There's a lot of conversations with a lot of people. They tell me, or oh, I see in the diary what's, what's going on, and some things I go, woohoo, that looks great, and other things go, ooh. But, you know, this, this is what they, they do. And um, at the end of the year, so the, the um, revenue or income generated from ticket sales, the cost of the bands come out of that. So that doesn't sit in your profit and loss. It's completely separate. Um, at the end of the year, if there is any surpluses in there, that goes stays in the pot f to generate more. And that's the way we interpret it on a... Is, is that...? Yeah. Phew, God. <laughs> uh, the one thing that, that can, can cause sometimes a problem is that the, often the people that run the, the venues are also you know, the musicians and the, the performers. And sometimes you can get into a problem if they are performing at the event as well and getting remunerated that way. And then it's that indirect remuneration or indirect distribution of the profits can cause a problem. But how you've described it is the, is the way that it should be working with the, the you know, the, the caveat. I'm just going to ask a question because I, I imagine um, we're a community interest company. If we were a, a private sole trade, a limited partnership, whatever, other organisation, could it be set up in the same way as long as you can demonstrate um, quite clearly that no one individual or group is benefiting from this income? So could a private organisation then set up a kind of other arm yeah. yeah, to do the same. 
Yeah, I, I, again, it, 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 the devil is in the detail, but it, it should be possible to do that, and it, it, it comes down to what is agreed in your, your articles. It, it provided the articles are quite clear to state that, you know, there isn't going to be any distribution of, the, of this profit, and that is what happens in reality, then that will qualify for the non-profit distributing element. Uh, and again, where you do make surpluses, provided you can demonstrate that those surpluses are reinvested for the benefit of that cultural activity, then uh, that, that qualifies. So can, I just, can I just ask an audience question? Out of everyone sitting here, who actually makes loads of profit on ticket sales? <laughs> Is that what keeps the business going? No, generally it covers itself, doesn't it? No. <laughs> Sorry? No, it just covers the cost of the band, yeah? You'd be lucky if it did, depends on the show and the audience. Yeah. And do you pay VAC on ticket sales? Absolutely. Well, then that's maybe something you should look at. Because you're not making a big profit anyway. If you're doing ticket sales for other promoters, though, how does that work? So if there's someone else who's booked a show in, are you just holding the money and handling the money for that, or do you have to pay the VAT on? Because well, we sell tickets for... We sell tickets through our site and it goes through our books and there's kind of tickets that we sell for the promoters and then we distribute that back to the promoter when it comes to a settlement. I think you would have to look at the, 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 the arrangements that are in place, but uh, again, it, it depends on who is the, seen as being the promoter for that show. It's the promoter who is responsible for accounting for the VET rather than necessarily the venue. And if the promoter doesn't meet the, the qualifications for uh, the, the, the cultural exemption, then the exemption doesn't apply. If the promoter does, even if the venue doesn't, because the venue is you know, distributing profits on its, its other activities, then uh, the, the promoter can qualify for the, for the exemption. It, 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 it's on a, an individual case-by-case -case basis. And oh, sorry, I just wanted to. Oh, I'll come to you in a second. Um, just I know there's lots of questions about VAT, but one thing I will just chuck into the mix as well when thinking about company structures and community interest companies. It's if VAT is going to cause something that's going to make it really confusing, then then maybe that's not the thing to focus on right now because there are loads of other benefits to describing your company in terms of its social and community benefit, whether you decide to become a CIC or register in your governance and articles as a social enterprise, what that can bring in other kinds of benefits is also really valuable to the business in terms of community contacts, in terms of potential other partnerships with other businesses in your area that could bring in other kinds of work and other kinds of events, in terms of getting social investors and other kind of grant funding in for what you do. Um, so the VAT question is obviously very important and can make a difference, but you're always going to have this tussle with ticket sales agents wanting to take their cut, artists who are VAT registered, what happens then? Um, you know, it can all get a bit tricksy. So I think just just being able to sort of pull out a bit and say, okay, if I look at this from another angle, um, yes, we've got the VAT question, but what other benefits are there in describing my company in terms of what it gives back to the community, which venues already do, so a lot of the first, I think the first step for a lot of venues is being able to clearly articulate that to their local authorities and to other investors in their communities, because that can really start to get some more momentum. Um, yeah, you, you were going to ask a question. Yeah, I'm glad this has come up, because uh, when I chaired a panel last year, I actually said the most venues do operate essentially as a community interest company, but usually without the um, approval um, or the, the rec validation, let's say. Um, we've been running a community interest company now for four years, which was basically us deciding to um, do what we've been doing for eight years anyway, um, um, but just have that kind of seal of approval. So uh, we run a lot of music business events in Scotland, including the, the Y Days conference. Um, 
Well, what, uh, there are a couple of things that really interested me. I mean, one that um, on the tax side of things that doesn't seem to have been really mentioned, but our understanding from our accountants is that you have the non-trading income, which is grants, so you don't pay tax on that, but on the trading income, which is ticket sales or anything that's deemed as sponsorship, and not just someone benevolently handing you over <laughs> a massive check, or not so massive in our case, uh, that is, um, that is taxable. So um, the ticket question is interesting because uh, for our smaller events, ticket does actually constitute quite a lot of the um, income. But is there anything else that um, would allow us to save on, you know, VAT or not have to get into that VAT zone? Because there is there's a chance that it might happen next year. And we'd rather avoid it, even though whenever someone books their travel and invoices us through their VAT registered company, we end up paying another 20% on it. Uh, there is a difference between uh, trading activities from a corporation tax point of view and uh, business activities and exempt activities from a VAT point of view. So uh, just simply because it's trading from a uh, corporation tax point of view doesn't necessarily mean that the 20% will apply. You know, it, it is still the, 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 the cultural exemption is still a trading activity, it's just that there is that relief available that avoids the, the need to account for the VAT. It does depend on your circumstances, you know, it's not a one size fits all, uh, it, you, you have to meet the conditions and, you know, you may be meeting the conditions for other reasons which allows you to then apply the, the VAT. Uh, but you have to look at your own status and your own circumstances, you can't just say, well, they're not charging VAT, therefore I'm not going to charge VAT. Question over here, yeah. Um, is there any way uh, you can signpost us with regards to maybe finding out um, more about um, the kind of p &L running actually kick? Because we have a kick set up. Um, but, I mean, our accountants, I mean, we've got good accountants who look after loads of different pubs, but they just don't get what constitutes being able to go into the kick and what doesn't. And I was going to ask, your, you've just, your wet sales obviously don't go through your kick, it's just literally ticket income and then all that goes through your kick company is the ticket and um, the, the payment for the vans that goes out, is that right? Um, no, ultimately the Human Antics Community Interest Company is the, is the name of our company and, um, and I manage the accounts on a weekly basis and everything that comes through that business is accounted for, everything that goes well, out the business is accounted for. What it, it, it's where you place it. So because, uh, for instance, ticket sales, obviously anything that if people buy a pint of beer, of course you've got to pay VAT, you get charged VAT. But the ticket sales we account for separately, but they are still there amongst the business because if we were audited, we'd have to you know, be able to explain everything and justify um, everything within our accounts. But I think that's something that would be really helpful for us because yeah. we are business has been up and running for years, we have a private limited, you know, limited company, but then we've just set up a kick a year ago, and it's how you actually merge, you know, how you start working with the two different companies, because we have different elements that I've been told that you can't have some of the elements like web sales going through a kick company. So, so you feel like the, the person dealing with your profit and loss accounts isn't quite understanding where things should be across the different areas of your business? Um, so I guess, do you, have you guys come across accountants who, uh, how would they advertise themselves as specialists in this area that might be better equipped to deal with this kind of issue? Well, m m most accountants that would be good on this would be ones that have a decent not-for-profit client base mm -hmm. because they're used to dealing with charities, which are a very specific way. And, and this is like a spin off, more spin off of charities in mm. this respect than it is on of companies. So they're normally the best ones I've found who, who understand this better. Um, I have a question in terms of company structure. Uh, I have a club of bar in Cardiff. We set up uh, back in the early 80s as a members club and an, an incorporated association. That's still the structure now, although the members element was more or less dissipated. Uh, we own the building. So transferring it from a um, corporate association to something else would obviously incur stamp duty. Um, we have got VAT exemption. One thing that's worth noting with the VAT exemption as well is you can get a back payment for up to three years 
Uh, that is four years now. Yeah. Should have waited another year. <laughs> um, we we've been looking at possibly setting up a charity uh, uh, structure for our company. We run by a board. We've always been run by a board. We're not for profit. So you're, you're not a charity at the moment. Then. We're not a charity. Well, we're in a corporate yeah. association. Um, and basically, as a members club. Yeah. We've had a lot of conversations with the charities commission, and the one thing that always crops up is validating the cultural worth of what we do. Um, I imagine if we were putting on opera or ballet, they wouldn't be asking the same questions that are going to provide evidence of yeah. the cultural worth, they be it reviews or, or, or whatever. Um, and I've been, I've been looking around to see if there are other venues out there that have gone down this route as a charity setup. I'm aware of Bantam Wall in Manchester, but there's a large educational element to what they do. Yeah. Yeah. Are the venues out there that are just purely venues that have gone down this route? Might be different for us because we own the building as opposed to renting. But I, I, I was wondering what your well, I must admit it's been a number of years since I've come across any, and off the top of my head, I couldn't give you one name. But I, I it's you know, Rich I, Mix. Do you know Rich Mix? Uh, it's a London-based one. They have they're a venue. They're multi multi arts venue. They have kind of education and participation stuff as part of what they do. Okay. But that's another example. There are, oh, sorry to jump in, no, I was just, no there, it is a growing question um, from a kind of policy point of view, and this touches on lots of things with music venues as, as, as well as some other places, um, with things coming from a kind of policy governmental level that arts and culture and music need to benefit from the growing amount of social investors out there. So these are people that want to invest in businesses and organizations that have a social and community benefit. Straight away, people recognize that to mean something like, well, we work with disadvantaged children, or it has um, in health and education, or in participation for, for, the, for older people. So how do you show what we all know is intrinsically part of running a music venue. It has a community value. It, is, it has an artistic value. It's, it's for people's well-being. How do you express that? How do you articulate that for some of these, um, you know, for, for saying how you could be a charity or a community interest company? So there are new and evolving frameworks about how people can identify and then measure and then write um, clearly in a kind of report their social impacts so I think if you were to like uh, uh, look up like social impact reporting frameworks on Google or something you'd see lots of people trying to come up with this answer because I think there actually is a whole bunch of money out there to support community interest companies and social enterprise that do good in the community and I think music venues can play a really crucial part in this and I think there is support out there in, in terms of money to help organisations do that kind of work. So it just needs a bit of time to show how we can properly present our case for about how music venues do that. So th there are frameworks out there that can help describe it. Just, just on the tax side, it is possible to get from an unincorporated association to a company without incurring capital gains tax or stamp duty. But it, it, it is a bit of a process, but it is possible. A couple more questions. Oh, yeah, Jen put the back with his hand up, and then we'll come to the front here. Yeah. Um, so just so I can be heard. Um, I feel like the structure of my venue, because we're a venue that programs its own events, I feel like this, what we are is probably what most people running venues are in the room, which is that we program our own music, but we're a music business that makes money through selling alcohol. In my head, the way to deal with this was to set up a separate company rather than change. Because we have a company structure we're allowed to make profit at once. I would hate to mess with that, but I'd love to be eligible for uh, funds from PRS Foundation, for instance. I'd like to be able to go to Arts Council, or in the case in Scotland, uh, Creative Scotland, be able to say, well, we're the kind of kind of company structure that you can fund. So what, what I thought in my head, we, the idea of the CICs was, is you keep the company you have to run the bar, the venue, and then all the programming is done by a CIC, which is not going to get tax on ticket sales, etc. Is that what you're recommending that we do? Yeah, that, that's why I said something. Yeah. Exactly what we do. Yeah, so that's, that's what you do. <laughs> I, I, you made a second yeah, company. You the, the 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 you're, you're running one company, yeah. 
which is putting through different income in different places, and you can't make money. But for those of us who currently have companies limited by shares, where we currently can make money, my accountant was a bit when I said, let's set up a CIC just for the tickets. And he went, I really don't understand that enough. Is this, is this legit? And I went, we're told it's legit. He's like, when you trust said it was legit, but it doesn't seem to be a pattern that's going. Is that the process that you recommend that we do if we already have a company that can make money? It's a set of set I, I, I think every, I think there are lots of different solutions that all work around similar kind of theme. Because what I'm recognising and what you're saying, there is a structure that Rich Mix have done, the, the venue in London, where they are a charity that runs uh, arts and music events. They have a trading arm, which is a straight up for profit trading arm for their bar and cafe. And then they have the charity, which is eligible for grant funding for doing all kinds of music related and arts related stuff. So there is that one. Um, in terms of a community interest company versus another trading arm, um, it would all depend on, I think, the relative balance of the two things. Um, so it's definitely worth getting advice from different areas, I think. I mean, with my business, I've yeah. got two limited companies running them on venue. And, and it's one of them a TIC? No. So I've got two actual private limited companies. One handles my ticketing, uh, the other one handles my wet sales and most of my staffing. Uh, the staffing is a little bit split because I do my door staff and my ticketing staff and then look at the handles ticket sales. And it just for me, it meant there was a, a taxation division that we could use during the first few years to just try and work out where we stood because I'm really new to this industry. I'm one of these local idiots who just bought the pub to stop it from closing down two years ago. And I've sort of been learning ever since, but I've got a small background in business. And there were benefits, but managing two private limited companies is horrible. I, I, can, I, can, I, can I already run two companies? Yeah. Because I definitely am the bar manager of that and I, in the night time, and I spend all my days as a programmer running that set of finances. You need like three brains, don't you? I'm just going to say, I know we're really very nearly out of time. In fact, we're over time. So I'm sure we're all hanging around if you wanted to ask any other questions or get advice. I know you had your hand up in the front here. Did you have a quick question? Um, it was, what is again with the structure of CICs as to, you're saying about people, we're looking at people who kind of run venues at the moment, but saying also they might have been the structures they can't take things off a certain level. Do you, with the structure of a CIC, does there have to be a committee above or? No, no, it's just no because that, that's, that's the advantage over above a charity, you don't need that committee no. above. And in fact, um, um, I have been talking to some people about who, who want capital extraction at the end of the day, how they keep the capital assets and maybe license them or lease them to the CIC so that you don't breach the CIC rules, but they do, they may possibly get the payback later. Because I mean, I'm in a position where I said, we're a limited company, I've been for two and a half years since we set up, and I'm at a point where I don't really, as long as I want the venue to con continue, yeah. I don't care whether my name is above the door, if I'm getting a shed load of money from where profits, because there aren't really that many profits to take it. I'd rather have a steady wage and be able to get from that, yeah. whether or not it's an option. But you could do that on the CIC without a profit, yeah. without, without a board above you, without interfering with the way you're doing it. So. And can I just make um, one other yeah, point, actually, just yeah. on, the, on the last one? There seems to be a concern that if a bar makes money, it can't be in a CIC. I don't agree with that. Because a CIC can make a profit. It's, what, it's the purpose of the CIC that's fundamental to its qualification as a CIC. So just because the bar makes a profit, that will go to fulfilling the community purposes. Therefore, it, you don't need two separate entities. So I, I, I think there's been a bit of confusion over that. Yeah. Until you want some dividends, right? Well, you, you can still have dividends, but you just, it, they can't. But also you could have but, a CIC. No, so there's a difference between the, the, the VAT relief and the CIC. You know, the, 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 the profit distribution is a, a barrier to the VAT relief. It's not a, prop, a barrier to the, the CIC. I think that's what our big, as you're saying, is our big thing we wanted to become a CIC is that there is a lot more funding. Yeah, also, it yeah. sits within yeah. the community. We've got an arts barge foundation yeah. in York that's been going for years and gets 
shed loads of funding every year. We've got six-year mm. underground pension funds, and yeah. I don't know where that is. Yeah, so, <laughs> but, yeah, but, yeah. Well, I'm going to have to ask. Uh, well, I'm going to have to ask if we don't mind. I never knew that VAT and rates and CIC would be such a hot potato. Um, there's, but there's loads more to find out. It's really useful to find out about this stuff. Thank you to the panel. Thank you to the audience for asking us difficult questions. Um, do come and chat to us. Thank you.